that one day write down equations which will explain the outcomes that you will see. And that's what we are hoping we would be able to do. And you might say, why do I need, I understand biology sufficiently. Um, one of the goals of mankind has been the ability to do more than what nature has given. Right? Okay? We could already walk and run, but we can now fly. Right? So we can do much more than an animal can do, and that's why mankind is kind rather than just a kingdom. And uh, biology, we haven't done that yet. We are just starting to scratch the surface. We are making artificial organs or just about are making artificial organs. We are just about getting there. We can understand what causes diseases and how to prevent them and preemptively create uh, interventions. One day, you will be in a scenario where we understand biology so sufficiently that we can predict when something goes wrong, what will be, uh, when if something goes wrong as molecularly or cellularly, what will be the outcome biologically. And or when biologically something goes wrong, we will be very quickly able to tell you what is Hello sir, how are you? Hi, good. I'm doing okay. How about you? Hi ma'am, I'm also doing good. Uh, so when I was uh, doing research, uh, reading about your research, what you do in lab, and I came on uh, IIC website and I went to your profile and the first line that I read on that uh, page was very interesting and it was a question and it goes like this. How do events taking place at the molecular level translate to biologically significant phenomena? And that was very interesting for me, that question. And what makes you ask this question? Okay. So, um, biology is very different from what you normally hear about physics and chemistries. In physics and chemistries, you hear about laws, right, reactions, which will happen every time, more or less the same way. Biology, you will never hear about laws. Right? There is no law of gravity. There is no law of motion. The reason biology hasn't reached that stage is biology, of course, is very complex. Right? And uh, we haven't been able to tie what happens at different levels to what shows up as a biologically uh, relevant thing that you normally see. Okay? For example, consciousness. Okay? You would think of it as a phenomena which can't be defined by laws. Okay? However, we know on the other side that everything is defined by more or less molecular principle, at least most of the biology that we know of at, at this moment can be described in terms of molecular level reactions which are propagating all the way back to the overall thing that you do. Even firing of neurons in your brain are actually molecularly controlled and cellularly controlled. So our hope is by being able to connect all this going from the first single molecule where these reactions happen, how these reactions happen, what are the outcome of those reactions, what happens to the cell because of those reactions, if we can tie them together, we will be able to connect everything from the molecule all the way to the biology. Right? And uh, then when we understand all these processes, we will be able to say, okay, there is a law in biology which is being followed. And that is the stage we would like to get to in biology. We haven't got there yet, but we will get there someday, provided we can understand this. So that's the hope of asking that question. So like, as deep as we go, yes. like at cellular level, then at molecular level, then at atomic level, yes. the more we understand what is going on superficially. It's, it's not superficial, I, I, it's profound. In fact, if you think about it, just that the complexity is just too large and hence we haven't been able to unravel the laws as we were able to do in physics and chemistry way early. Okay, biology laws still are not laws yet. They have remained observations and some anecdotal uh, revelations and discoveries. That will come. One day I'm hoping that that will come and we are trying to make our attempts to do this exercise, exactly same exercise.
So like in physics we have all those equations as simple yes, like yes. E is equal to mc square yes. explains a phenomena. Yes. Uh, then in biology you, you will be able to add one day write down equations which will explain the outcomes that you will see. And that's what we are hoping we would be able to do. And you might say why do I need I understand biology sufficiently. Um, one of the goals of of mankind has been the ability to do more than what nature has given, mm. right? Okay, we could already walk and run, but we can now fly, right? So we can do much more than an animal can do, and that's why mankind is a kind rather than just a kingdom. And uh, biology, we haven't done that yet. We are just starting to scratch the surface. We are making artificial organs or just about are making artificial organs. We are just about getting there. We can understand what causes diseases and how to prevent them and preemptively create uh, interventions. One day you will be in a scenario where we understand biology so sufficiently that we can predict when something goes wrong, what will be the, uh, when if something goes wrong as molecularly or cellularly, what will be the outcome biologically? And or when biologically something goes wrong, we will be very quickly able to tell you what is going wrong molecularly and fix it very quickly. Like, I have done my undergraduation and post-graduation in biology and <laughs> I'm still not able to grasp how uh, this equation thing can be achieved in biology. So can you please explain with an example? I mean. Sure. So for example, um, let's imagine a virus growing inside a cell. The virus needs to first get inside the cell um, by what is called membrane fusion. And usually all RNA viruses which have an envelope on them, they will get inside the cell uh, using this process. There's uh, a time that is required. There's a kinetic process that is required for it to get inside the cell. Okay? Then the virus will uh, have to convert its proteins um, into uh, so it will have to translate its protein, it uses the host ribosomes and it makes those proteins. Till the host proteins are made, the viral RNA is sitting, waiting, because the polymerase to make copies of that virus doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Okay, You can then, each of these steps that I am describing uh, have some time associated with it. You can think of it as a chemical reaction. Okay, The molecule is complex. But each of these processes are molecular reactions that need to happen. Mm -hmm. So I can associate a time constant with them or kinetic rate constant with it. Okay? The combination of all these is what is going to be the total number of viruses produced at the end of the reaction uh, after many cycles of sometimes inside a single cell. Okay? But I know that each of these processes have some inhibitors sometimes. Right? Sometimes they are some very specific problems associated with them. So I know that I can stop each of these reactions at some places. So I can make a model for the full reaction, all the way from starting from the virus getting inside the cell, all the way to the total number of viruses released in terms of mathematical kinetical model. Okay? I can write those equations down and I can tell you that I can reproduce exactly the, what the virus is going to produce at the end of the day out of from a single cell by just simulating that equation. So in PCR, we have that equation, 2s2n, yes. right? No. no, so that is just, uh, that's not a, yeah, so I, I should, uh, so that is just telling you what is the number of copies that will be generated, okay? Mm -hmm. But the reaction is equally complex because every time there is a rate at which the polymerase will bind to it, the primers will bind to it. So even that is a rate constant that you should keep in mind. Okay? If you reduce the polymerase concentration, the rate will change mm -hmm. and the reaction, I can predict that reaction. Okay? Same goes for your primer concentrations. If, the, if you do the, pri reduce the primer concentration or reduce the temperature, I know what will happen to the rate constant. So I can reproduce that curve exactly. Before you have done that experiment, I can tell you exactly what the curve will look like. That's the kind of understanding a law or a mathematical model will give you. And that's what we are after. So, Today it's a reaction, virus growth, tomorrow it could be growing of a limb or uh, a disease, a progression of cancer and so on and so forth. We will reach that stage. That is the 
uh, stage we want to reach in biology. Uh, and that's why it's not only biologists doing it. Engineers, mathematicians, and physicists are also interested in doing this. Okay. Uh, uh, what I am thinking right now, like when I was a student, mm -hmm. and I like physics more mm -hmm. than chemistry. Yes. Because chemistry had many exceptions. Yes. Uh, biology has all exceptions. And right? now, when biology will be like yes. this in yes. this format, in yes. the format of this equation, mathematical yes. equations. Yes. It will be having more exceptions. Yeah. So you might chemistry. say, if if it was mathematical uh, equations. Uh, and the outcome was very, very well decided, uh, then how do I have exceptions, okay? And that's the fun part in biology, that the exceptions are very, very high because the reactions are also very, very unique, okay? When in chemistry, you have two molecules which just need to collide with each other in a certain orientation for a reaction to happen. In biology, each molecule itself is a long polymer, Okay, which is 3D folded, has modifications, trans post translational modifications, and so on and so forth. Their numbers inside the cells are fluctuating all the time. Okay, so they are never uh, in equilibrium. What, so equilibrium reactions are very easy to understand. Chemistry has all lots of equilibrium reactions. In fact, chemistry is mostly done in equilibrium conditions. These are called non-equilibrium conditions. In this everything fluctuates and most of the time we don't have an understanding of what the outcome will be because what was the initial state, the state at which this reaction was happening, how many molecules we had, what orientations you had, all that will define the outcome. Okay, Numbers will define the outcome. Inside the bacteria, you will find that the total number of proteins is maybe five, especially for a transcription factor. Let's say, have you heard of lac repressor, right? Uh, only five copies of proteins are present in that. The problem with those kinds of very small numbers inside a bacteria is less a bacteria divides, okay? And when the bacteria divides, you have got yourself one protein sometimes, or and four proteins, or three proteins and two proteins. Sometimes you have got one bacteria which did not even get a protein, the other one got all the five proteins because the phenomena is like rolling a dice, right? Stochastic is the term we normally use uh, technically. Now this bacteria which did not get the protein has no idea how to control. So this bacteria is going to behave completely differently than the other bacteria which has the proteins. So this stochastic phenomena is extremely large, again because so this is an exception to the rule, okay? So we see this in biology all the time. Biology also has a lot of redundancies built in, which kind of goes back and forth uh, and corrects. So you don't fall apart every time a reaction fails, mm -hmm. right, inside your body. Every reaction has an efficiency because the body has built in lots of checks and balances to ensure that you function. Maybe your reaction is not 100% efficient, but the redundancies ensure that you still continue to function with maybe a little less fidelity or a little less of uh, efficiency, okay? So we are learning all these things. Uh, and hopefully, eventually, you will be able to write all of these equations. Maybe a large number of equations will be required to understand everything. But once you do, uh, you will be able to reproduce life, at least on paper, okay? But I wouldn't be surprised if you can, once you take that, you will be able to reproduce it also more or less with quite a true approximation uh, in nature as well. I'm just worried about those students who avoid maths. Right? Yes, to take yes, biology it is, and it then is, take if, biology. If you, there's one thing that um, uh, if you take home from uh, this uh, kind of uh, discussion is that please don't avoid math. Okay, it's scary, uh, I know, uh, because, but actually, if you think about it, math is much, much easier and intuitive than biology is. Because in maths, the results are absolutely well defined. Okay, if the same procedures and same protocols will give you exactly the same thing. In biology, you do this five times and you can get five different results all the time. Right? You always have an error bar associated with it. In maths, uh, of course, some processes will give you error bars, but the math itself is completely well-defined. 
So you can't learn it and then not expect the same answer. Yeah, and one more thing that for math, you can do experiments on a paper. Yes, absolutely. A lot of work is being done. Uh, Violet is an expensive uh, ex experimental science. Okay, Because we did not have these laws, we had to literally cut open a person to be able to understand the physiology of a person. So it's very expensive, as you would imagine, for every step of the way. But since we are learning more and more, we are moving things to the computer. Computers are becoming powerful, more and more powerful. They can handle many more equations than they could handle uh, just 10 years ago. And hence, we can simulate a lot of processes which for doing experiments would just be so very expensive to do. Okay? So that's why uh, science will learn a lot on we will learn a lot about biology on computers and hence if you don't know programming and if you don't know math uh, the future students definitely will be left behind so they need to be taught this going forward so on this note that computers are getting stronger smarter day by day i was i had podcast on structural biology and how bioinformatics and structural biology is accelerating the drug development process sure. so like in that direction this approach mm -hmm. will also accelerate drug discovery process mm -hmm. or applications like that because we will be able to predict better with yes. the help of math in biology and then like on that Absolutely. Note. in fact uh, almost all processes you will be able to do better mm -hmm. because um, not just finding the right molecule finding the right target where to find the, which step of the way should you find the target? How many different targets can you attack at the same time? All these questions can be done on the computer now. Okay? And you should be able to go back and say, I have worked out this best combination uh, of drug, number of drugs, what time to give those drugs, right? how much drugs to give you so that you get the best outcome with the least amount of drug given to you. So we, we will reach all those within the next 10 years. This is the need because AMR is coming. Personalized yes. medicine concept is... It will happen. It, That's it will absolutely happen. going to happen. And it's happening it's already. It's actually. happening and like to find new drugs and everything. We can not yes. go with conventional approach. Yes. We have to use this approach. Yes. No, so uh, biology has uh, done a lot based on intuition. Of scientists uh, but sometimes you will find that biology is counterintuitive as well in many cases uh, and those are hard to quickly unravel if you rely on just on your intuition but mathematics and physics don't care about intuitions they follow the ground truth and things built on ground truth and that's what we want to take advantage of okay so you might think something is counterintuitive, but if physics says it's true, then that is what is going to be true in biology. Okay. Now, now talking about your research here yes. at IISC, now you do work on RNA replication. Yes. And two things, why and how? Okay. So we study RNA replication uh, in a very special context. Uh, we are interested in uh, RNA viruses. Uh, Many like SARS-CoV-2, Dengue, Zika, you hear about them all the time. Viruses are famous now. <laughs> very, very After famous. When I, when I started, it was not the case. Uh, but now I don't need to convince anybody that people should work on RNA viruses. And uh, people used to ask me, why am I doing this in chemical engineering? Uh, and I used to say, look, the biologists have already been working, but I think we need to include new approaches and new ideas in these areas because usually because they are not considered very so-called uh, glamorous people used to percolate all these these ideas used to percolate into these fields much much later mm -hmm. but there was an extremely important need to be able to do this and we have seen this with SARS-CoV-2 so coming back to RNA replication uh, RNA replication is the way the RNA is being uh, copied in the virus and virus is making its own copies and growing inside the body. Okay? The drugs, if you want to make the drugs, 
the drugs that have been extremely successful in controlling viruses are usually RNA replication inhibitors. They basically target the RNA polymerase. So if you take uh, HIV, many of the drugs are actually RNA polymerase inhibitors. You take hum hepatitis virus, most of them are targeting the RNA polymerase. So it's a very good target. Uh, the RNA virus uses its own dedicated proteins to make it. And unlike um, humans uh, where there are several RNA polymerases and so it, there's some redundancy built to a certain extent, uh, RNA viruses have only one, okay? So if you want to make an inhibitor, that's a great target, okay? But they also have a lot of complexity within them. So, so what happens is uh, we don't always understand how the replication is going on, uh, what are the things that are needed for the virus to make this. See, it's fighting an uphill battle. It gets inside the cell, it's made out of 80 proteins. The cell has like 200,000 proteins inside, right? all sorts of mechanisms to stop the virus from growing. And this one protein of the virus is supposed to make this, whereas the cell has so many to kind of prevent it from doing that. Yet it is able to overcome. So it's a remarkable so-called machinery, if you think about it, that it's able to overcome all this. So in terms of evolution also, it is a great system to study on how it is able to do all the things that using a single protein, what requires a human cell so many different ways. Okay, so and if we can understand it, of course, then we can come up with inhibitors for it. So that's what we study, and we take advantage of new techniques and new methods, uh, take advantage of the fact that we have now sensitivities to measure properties of a single protein. Mm -hmm. We do experiments where we can watch a single RNA getting copied, or we do an experiment where a single RNA is getting unwound by the viral helicase, um, and that is necessary for you to make copies of it. So we can do this using uh, microscopes that we build, which allows us to visualize this process in real time. So you can watch protein kind of unwind or make new copies of it, okay? And that kind of sophistication is not always needed, but it gives you the kind of insight which is very, very easy to interpret because we have seen the whole process rather than an average outcome of the total process. So I, I understood the uh, why, why part of yes. the uh, RNA replication research that you are doing. Yeah. Uh, to get some more clarity on how, mm -hmm. that, because that, in, that is interesting in fact to know. Yes. So you have, you like, this is what I understood that you must be having cells a uh, normal human cells or any other animal cell then you must be infecting it with virus and you must be knowing like what are the components of virus and you must be having some inhibitors that will inhibit those components and stop the replication. Right. So we do that uh, but that is not at this moment always for replication. Mm -hmm. We try to target all parts of the uh, cell uh, virus growth uh, and the idea is there slightly different than what I'm going to describe for RNA replication. The idea there is um, you have a lot of different inhibitors, molecule, drugs, which work to a certain extent for uh, viruses in general. Okay. The problem is that they don't work extremely well because as soon as a new virus comes, you find that the virus is, that same drug was working but not so well. So, well. so there what we do is we you use a combination of these inhibitors, but targeted towards different kind of processes within the virus growth, such that we can come up with the best strategy for reducing it. And instead of inventing a new drug, which might take 10 years before it is actually a viable candidate and is actually coming into, if we can find off the shelf drugs, which will work, even if they work poorly, Individually, we are looking for combinations where they will synergize and give you a much, much higher uh, ability to kill the virus. Okay, So that's a different strategy. We do this strategy also. How do we study replication of the RNA is we don't even go to the cell. 
we know the protein is responsible for creating the new copy of the RNA. Okay, we purify the protein. As I told you, we can go from the molecule all the way back there. So the molecule is doing the copying. So it has all the tricks up its sleeves to be able to copy, right? How does it, so uh, if you know about RNA polymerases or DNA polymerases, they usually would need first to identify where to copy. Viral RNA, uh, especially Zika and uh, dengue viruses, they, they come from a family called flaviviruses. The flaviviruses basically have a very unique architecture. They have a small single molecule they have to copy, right? How do I co make a copy of something from start to finish and yet I know that I have to find the start point? So here the start point, so just imagine that I have to run a race. I've been told I have to run from here, but I've been told that I can't stand before that because there's no place to stand, mm -hmm. right? So how does the polymerase then bind to something and start? So the virus has a clever trick. The virus basically takes its tail and kind of couples it to its head mm -hmm. so that the tail acts as your platform to stand on and then start the process, okay? We can watch this process in real time. When does it decide to have the tail attached? Because the way the tail is attached uh, will define whether replication will happen. If the tail is not attached, then it will decide whether translation should happen. Okay, so this decision is being made inside the cell by the molecules. The virus doesn't have a brain of its own, the, by the molecules and the concentration of the molecules. We can replicate this kind of a behavior outside the cell by playing with the concentration of the proteins, the structure of the uh, RNA. The structure has to be something unique in the sense that it, the tail has to know where the head is. So it has complementary regions which will allow and you make mutations in this, it will change the balance between the core closed form and the open form. So we ask these questions because if you can perturb this balance, you can take the virus from mostly replicating to now doing mostly translation. And translation will produce more viral proteins. Those viral proteins will produce antigens for the immune system to see in, uh, and yet keeping the virus low. Okay. So I have got a way, a strategy for making a vaccine because that's what you want for a vaccine, right? You want lots of antigens of the virus, but not really a virus replicating a lot. Okay. So these are the kinds of ideas we try to take advantage of and come up with interventions, vaccines or drugs uh, by studying the processes, sometimes completely in vitro at the molecular level. All right. So uh, that's all questions I had okay. and thank you very much for your time and it was really interesting to know this RNA application and everything around it. Okay. So thank you for your time sir.